Okay, so uh, uh, let's see, we are starting out with uh, a discussion of uh, structure today. And uh, uh, so the next uh, uh, couple of topics would be uh, 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 structural properties and uh, 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 as well as, you know, things like phase diagrams and uh, uh, if you, you know, when we claim that uh, for uh, many of these devices we talked about, uh, uh, you know, there'll be alloys and uh, um, uh, such as indium gallium arsenide, indium gallium nitride, and uh, silicon germanium alloys. Uh, uh, so, but, but you know, chemically, are they feasible? Uh, do they mix in the right proportions? Can you actually create them? Uh, uh, how does their uh, uh, is it uniform over uh, large areas? And and it, so, so that, that aspect of it, we'll we'll, we'll invest, start investigating now. And uh, um, whenever we are at the point where uh, I can relate to the uh, electronic properties or photonic properties, I will do that in, 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 you know, as, we, as we move along here. So, so that's chapter four. Uh, and then uh, uh, we have already covered chapter five from the book, which was uh, the uh, uh, electronic structure, band structure, etc. So, and we'll, after this topic, we'll go over to the uh, more details of alloys and look specifically at, uh, uh, you know, things like Boeing parameters and quaternaries and ternary alloys and such things. Okay? So, so uh, we'll, we'll start with the uh, structural properties uh, uh, today. And uh, uh, I think uh, um, in your introductory uh, courses, you, you, you have probably uh, encountered this uh, many times, either in solid state physics or uh, uh, in some course on crist uh, crystallography in uh, uh, material sciences. Uh, so we, we, we know now that uh, um, if you have a, a solid made of uh, a atoms, actually uh, um, if you have a crystal that's formed of atoms, and we're going to kind of uh, um, go through it uh, initially, we'll look at it qualitatively, and then we're going to develop the uh, in a full-blown quantitative picture for this. Okay. So uh, if you have a crystal, we know it's a periodic arrangement of atoms. Uh, uh, and uh, as, uh, at this stage, we are not interested in what are the details of the atoms right now, uh, as much as uh, you know it's a geometrical or mathematical set of points in in in, in space, right? So, uh, so it's a mathematical set of points, and uh, based on uh, uh, the definition uh, or the mathematical definition of a, a lattice is is, is what's uh, uh, you know uh, I think intuitively you can see that if you start out at any point and you have a periodic lattice. Uh, uh, then uh, if I uh, kind of add an integer number of lattice constants in one direction and the other, I always end up at another lattice point. Right? So, so that's the intuitively uh, how you define uh, a lattice. Uh, and a lattice is just a, a set of points in space. You know, it has nothing to do with atoms and what atoms are sitting there. It's just a, a mathematical set of points in space. Right? Uh, and a lattice is periodic. Okay? Uh, now, uh, you can ask the question immediately, uh, uh, just like we did for electronic properties and density of states and wave functions and all, uh, does it have a, you know, th this question, uh, does it have a uh, connection with uh, dimensionality, right? And the answer is, of course, yes. And, and uh, uh, what is really interesting is in, uh, if you look at uh, two dimensions, for example, uh, you can have uh, five different classes of uh, lattice point uh, of, of crystal lattices so, so they're, and, and there are only five so, so for, uh, for two dimensions okay? and they're all sketched here uh, uh, you know, so, so they have different names you know I think you can see this is an oblique lattice so essentially the points here the green uh, are you can imagine them as atoms but it's whatever object is tied to that lattice point okay? whatever object uh, is tied to the lattice point okay? so uh, and uh, uh, just as an example, uh, in connection to the course, uh, the, uh, all the 2D uh, layered materials that uh, at least we have discussed in this course, like graphene, boron nitride, molysulfide, you know, tin diselenide, you know, all these things uh, are basically uh, of the uh, 2D hexagonal lattice form. So, 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 uh, and, uh, so, so if you look at the uh, lattice points, uh, the the uh, uh, what what uh, yeah so so th this is basically e to each point will be attached a set of atoms could be one atom could be two atoms and and so on and then that will build up the whole physical crystal lattice okay, so so uh, for two dimensions we have five bravais lattices and these are these you know uh, kind of what you might call as the uh, um, 
you know, b most uh, fundamental or uh, reduced set of b b basic uh, uh, lattice uh, parameters are called Bravais lattices after the person who, who in, in, introduced and realized this concept initially. Uh, so in, in 3D, uh, instead of five Bravais lattices, you have 14 Bravais lattices. Okay, so these are 14 ways to fill 3D space with, with the uniform lattice points, and they are distinct. These 14 are distinct, and uh, you know they go from triclinic, you know, monoclinic, uh, uh, and uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but but uh, what I want to kind of point out is uh, the conventional uh, semiconductors uh, uh, go, uh, for example, you have face-centered cubic, right? Uh, so most of you have seen this, right? Uh, at least introductory, okay, yeah. Um, so face-centered cubic, you know, if you look at diamond uh, cu cubic structure, silicon, germanium, gallium arsenide, indium arsenide, they are all of the face FCC kind, you know, face-centered cubic and they're uh, the cubic lattice. Okay. So uh, the f uh, just remember that, for example, if you look at uh, uh, silicon or gallium arsenide, the lattice is exactly the same, but uh, uh, the basis atoms in silicon, how many basis atoms are there in a silicon crystal? So, yeah, two, right? Yeah, and we, we talked that, and we, if you remember back uh, when we were calculating tight binding band structure, we needed that information, how many atoms are there in the unit cell, right? Uh, yeah, so it's so in the basis. Okay. So, uh, but this lattice is completely agnostic. It doesn't care how many atoms you put there, right? So it, you can put two atoms, they may be the same, could be different, it doesn't care. Lattice is independent of that, right? So, so that's what it's kind of trying to stress right now. Uh, so FCC uh, is, 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 is the standard semiconductors, uh, 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 the slightly uh, you know, uh, newer ones that I mentioned, gallium nitride and aluminum nitride are hexagonal. So one lattice constant, which is, uh, you can look at it if you turn it around. This, so there's a one lattice constant that way and another lattice constant in this hexagonal plane. Uh, and uh, uh, so the, some of the variants of, uh, of, of, of this structure uh, would be um, you know, all kinds. So, okay, and then this tetragonal copper indium selenide or copper indium gallium selenide SIGs, the ones that are used for solar cells, uh, 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 would be like this. Uh, one of the newest uh, wide, extremely wide band gap semiconductors now is gallium oxide, GA2O3. It crystallizes in many phases, but one of the uh, sta kind of stable phases now with which you can grow large bulk crystals is this uh, beta phase, uh, or it's a monoclinic structure. It's slightly tilted and, and uh, um, okay, so, so uh, uh, one of the important properties of the uh, uh, lattice structures or the Bravais lattices is, is uh, uh, you know, once you attach atoms to them and form a crystal, uh, some semiconductors, uh, as, a, as an example, let's say gallium nitride, uh, it can crystallize either in, a hex, you know, in this word site sort of hexagonal form or it can also crystallize in, in a FCC form. It can do both ways. You know. Uh, the chemical bonds, the number of electrons in the outermost shell, and all allow it to do that, right? Now the question is, which one will it really form, right? That's that's the question, and that that really uh, brings us to you know nearest neighbors and and packing. You know, how do you pack them, and what is the energy cost of of the uh, formation of the bonds and such? Okay. So uh, as an example here, we are looking at three uh, different. Uh, 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 you know, you can call them crystals uh, right now. You can call them semiconductors too. Uh, it's you know, this would be uh, hexagonal close back sapphire. You know, Al two O three. Now, um, and the, you can see the atoms of aluminum, oxygen. You know, it's a, you can, there's a triangle inside, another triangle, and so on. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, uh, HCP. Uh, this is simple cubic. A simple cubic uh, would be, uh, as an example, strontium titanate, which is a, uh, which is an oxide semiconductor, right? and uh, so it has a titanium sitting right uh, uh, in the uh, middle of the cube. It's right in the middle of the cube, and then uh, oxygen in the face centers of the. It's an octahedra of oxygen, right? So the two tetrahedra on top of each other. And, and then you have uh, the strontium at the uh, uh, vertices of this cube, right? so strontium titanate. And uh, uh, so uh, what happens in strontium, as an example, is, is, is the titanium atom can actually uh, move uh, relatively uh, easily. And as a result of that, and also this uh, titanium and oxygen 
um, are extremely polar in some sense. It's, a, it's, a, it's a oxygen can uh, you know, essentially pull the electrons away from titanium, just like we had talked about for gallium nitride. You know? So, so it, it's almost an ionic solid in that sense. Uh, and as a result, uh, uh, it can go through very interesting uh, sort of phase transitions as you lower the temperature. Start at room temperature, it behaves like a normal uh, semiconductor, but as you start lowering the temperature, the, I, the vibrations of the titanium atom start going through phases where it goes into ferroelectric phases and in all kinds of other, other things like that as you lower the temperature. Okay. So uh, um, anyway, that comes about from the fact that it's simple cubic and, and so certain symmetries allow, that, allow these transitions to happen. And you know, So I'm, I'm going to discuss that a little bit now. And then there's gallium arsenide. It's a generic uh, you know, zinc blend structure. But uh, all the you know, crystals that are conventional semiconductors, uh, diamond, silicon, germanium, they all are like this, except uh, for elemental semiconductors, the two atoms are the same. That's, that's the major difference. Okay? So uh, of course, it's uh, uh, you know, uh, not, not very difficult to uh, look at uh, uh, the pictures once it's drawn. But uh, obviously, we are interested in how, how do you actually figure out something? You know, how do you measure it? And uh, how do you? Uh, Experimentally, for example, uh, uh, f deduce uh, that that uh, certain crystal structure is like that, certain is like that, and so on. Right? So yeah, we want to look at that, uh, and and some other preliminaries. I think you're also pretty well aware that uh, uh, you can, because in a bravais lattice, you know, you 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 have a unique uh, basis vectors in A X and A Y, for example, in this two D lattice. Uh, you can, in general, define. Uh, <coughs> Um, a, a real space translation vector, right? That takes you from any lattice point to an, any other, right? So, right? So you can generally define it, and I think it's pretty clear that if you have, for example, uh, um, you know, a, a, a lattice with, a, I don't know, let's say three uh, three-dimensional lattice, which which will have three three uh, lattice vectors, then then you, you you can have an integer here, another integer here. And another integer here, so that defines a direction. And that's pretty clear, right? And a, a vector in 3D space. Right? It's pretty clear. And these are very importantly, these are integers, right? If you are not an integer, you will not end up at another lattice point. And that's clear, right? So, so you will not. Uh, so it's it's a translation vector. Uh, and and uh, uh, so uh, so as a result, you can, we generally combine them, right? And we write this thing as uh, uh, indicative of the direction with the understanding. Yeah, that I know the I know the real space translation vectors. I have already identified them, uh, you know, and uniquely, and I'm not going to change that. So, so I'm going to just change, say, along, uh, you know, zero zero one one zero one uh, one zero zero and you know zero one zero. Let's say, for example, right? So you just fix them and then you change this by basically changing these integers. Now you're sampling over the entire crystal. So the whole silicon, let's say, an eight inch or a ten inch wafer. That whole thing, you can go from one end to 10 inch, uh, the other end, by choosing large integers. That, that's what th this really means. And the whole thing is basically one molecule, right? The whole silicon crystal or whole gallium arsenide crystal. If there are no defects, it's just one perfect crystal. So, so. Uh, generally, it's not thought of that way, but it's actually true. Uh, you know, these are really some of the most perfect materials ever been created by human beings till now. So it's, you know, uh, the whole thing is one crystal, right? So, uh, uh, so you uh, the, the, this these obviously now define a direction. Any any direction now between two lattice points uh, is that vector, right? Uh, and I think it's very clear that uh, uh, one of the most, uh, uh, or rather, every direction is perpendicular to a plane, right? a two-dimensional plane. Right? That's very clear. Right? So, so for example, this direction is perpendicular. To uh, right, let's sketch it in the right way. Um, okay, so so there is a plane that looks like that, and uh, I think this really looks at an angle now, right? So, right. <laughs> All right, so something like that, right? So this direction would be uh, going through that, right? So so it's perpendicular to a plane, uh, and uh, uh, so this plane. Uh, uh, what does that mean? Essentially, if you take any vector on this plane, take a dot product with that that vector, you get a zero. Right? Cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So, so this plane, uh, as a result, 
uh, is uniquely defined by that uh, by that uh, lattice uh, by that lattice vector, and the plane uh, we generally are you know according to Rocket's book the notation he uses is uh, as a result the same vector can uh, define the plane as well right so the plane to which it's perpendicular right? is that clear so, so and 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 so these two quantities are go hand in hand in some sense right uh, and. Uh, um, <clears throat> Now, um, so so the uh, what we are going to look at is you know there are obviously many crystal planes. If you cut through, uh, uh, you know this this lattice, uh, th you can see there are planes. For example, like this, where there's uh, there's aluminum, oxygen, aluminum, oxygen, and so on. Right? You can go a slightly angled plane where there will be both aluminum and oxygen, aluminum and oxygen, and so on. So you have basically elemental planes or compound planes and that sort of thing as you kind of change the different planes. Right? So, so that's also clear. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and I think I'm not going to belabor this. I think you have probably seen that. And you can define Miller indices and all these other qu quantities based on these things, right? So uh, where, where the plane intersects. Uh, your x, y, and z axes, uh, one over, you know, the, so wherever this plane intersects, there will be three points over. If you take a, f a plane and uh, three dimensional coordinates, it will always intersect at one, two, or three points, I mean, maximum of three points, right? And then that's pretty clear, so, uh, uh, and then and, and that defines its, defines its Miller indices, et cetera. Okay. So uh, uh, now, uh, one of the questions about which crystals, so let's say gallium nitride can go into a cubic phase. Or it can go into a, uh, you know, hexagonal or wurzite phase, and it could go either this way or that way. Which phase will it go into, for example, right? Uh, and and that obviously is dependent on, on on things like packing and energies of of of, uh, of the chemical bonds. And then and the picture for packing is, I, I think, also you understand that you can either stack up, you know, the atoms perpendicular on top of each other. That would be a simple structure. Whereas if you stack the next atom inside the hole or the you know hollow part in between the three atoms here right that would that that would consider that would be considered to be a closed pack structure so right D does that make sense i mean so so the stacking sequence is, is is slightly different a simple structure would be like this uh, a closed pack structure would be like this right? Right. so and and based on these and 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 the details which uh, probably at some later point we are going to look at the numerics of this but uh, uh, and and the bond energies for example if uh, if you calculate, uh, you know, you take a reasonably large chunk of the solid, and and uh, with a lot of unit cells, and you uh, calculate the total energy uh, of you know chemical bonds and formation. We were going to discuss. We are going to discuss this in some detail. Let's say a total energy of uh, uh, of the wurzite phase for gallium nitride, which will be a sum of all the you know sm small p s bond energies, individual bond energies, and such, and you. Uh, look at say the uh, uh, the uh, you know cubic uh, form of it. Uh, so the cubic form would have uh, let's say something like this, uh, and then the hexagonal or the words that form would be something like that. And you look at the difference of the energies, uh, and if you have you know n unit cells, uh, so so if this is uh, for example uh, greater than reasonably greater than k t per atom or per unit unit. Cell, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay, so so basically, you can multiply the right hand side. So every unit cell will have an order of kT. Okay, so uh, if if you have, uh, maybe I should multiply it by the number of unit cells because this is the total uh, energy. Uh, uh, then uh, then obviously this one will be preferred you know, so, so over that one. So so that's that's the. Uh, thing uh, and and uh, the larger it is, the more is the uh, lowering of energy. So the crystal wants to be in that you know whatever phase is the uh, has the uh, 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 is that is that right? I think I should be. <laughs> what did I write here? So whatever is the lowest energy, the, wherever is the total lowest energy, that's where it's going to go. You know, so does it make sense? Okay. Uh, let me. Um, uh, uh, because basically the whole thing, you know, the crystal and uh, and the you know surroundings, if you when you are growing it, uh, form a closed thermodynamic system, and we're going to actually discuss that uh, as the next topic. So wherever is the lowest energy, that's where the the uh, crystal will go. For example, here it it it, it will uh, uh, be in the in the wurzite structure as an example. Okay, so so. Uh, <clears throat> 
So what I want to uh, do next is, is really get into some of the details of, uh, uh, I, I think you can see that if you are just one or two unit cells, it's kind of, you know, the, it's a couple of KTs, you can go either way. But if you have 10 to the power 20, this is actually a very large, uh, you know, it locks it in. I mean, it, it doesn't let you go into the other phase. It becomes very, very stable. Right? So, so, it's, uh, so the energies really add up uh, as, you, as you increase. Uh, and uh, the typical bond energy, uh, what is a typical bond energy between two atoms? Order of magnitude. Yeah. An electron volt, roughly. I mean, it could be a, a slightly more or less. Uh, and I, I think you know this is... 26 millivolt, milli electron volt at, at room temperature, right? So, so uh, I think you can see right away you need at least you know 100 or 1,000 1, unit cells to kind of really tilt it, you know, tilt it in a decisive way in one way or the other. If there are competing phases, if there are no competing phases, this this discussion doesn't come up at all. No, so, okay, so. Uh, so, uh, so as a result, if you know, if you grow a very large crystal, single crystal a wafer, or a, even a quantum well, very you know, of, over a wafer, generally it's it will go into one phase. I mean, it won't it won't try to twist or turn and all that, right? But people have been recently, uh, over the last you know five ten years, trying to grow, you know, uh, nano wires and and things like that, where the uh, number of unit cells is really not that large. So, so, so. And then what in inevitably happens is if you're growing it in certain conditions, for example, let's say this is a gallium arsenide compound semiconductor nanowire where the diameter is, uh, you know, tens of nanometers or something like that. So you can, you, you see the number of cells is not that large now. It, it's very small, could be, a, you know, a little long. So what you end up getting is even though you're growing it under the same condition, you will get phases which are wurtzite, zinc blend, wurtzite, zinc blend, and so on. So it will kind of go back, back and forth. You know. and, and, and that's because of, you know, you, you're kind of starting to go, the total energy is not too far off from KT at which you are growing, and therefore it starts forming these, you know, uh, different phases of, of, of the crystal. Yeah? How does that happen? Shouldn't the first structure that's grown, like, seed the orientation Next. Very good point. Yeah. So uh, uh, it's it's still you know uh, people are arguing about exactly the re reason for it. But what happens really is the uh, there are many scales of energies. You are right. So so there is you know the, this will be a seed for the next. But then there's also the aspect of temperature. Okay. So the temperature you are controlling on a substrate back here, but that temperature is not translating here. You know. So as as you get farther, it's getting kind of colder as well. So it, it's it's uh, yeah. So there are. Save several such aspects which feed this, and but you're right. I mean, if 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 you are, you uh, oh by the way, so you can actually for uh, certain semiconductors, you can generally what you see is as you raise the temperature, this go, I mean starts reducing this this sort of uh, you know uh, um, sections of what's in zinc blend, you know, and and uh, uh, and then you can play some games. You can controllably go from one to another. That would that's nice, and then such things. So. Okay, so 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 that's a uh, uh, detail. But uh, um, what I want to get to really is is uh, how do we uh, you know quantify uh, things like crystallinity, uh, polycrystalline, amorphous layers, uh, and and uh, how does the size figure in? If you have a large crystal or a small crystal, uh, you know, and, and and such things, how how, how do you uh, quantify the the uh, crystallinity of any compound semiconductor or elemental semiconductor or any, any such thing. So, so we're going to look at that now. I think you have probably seen this. Uh, uh, and what I want to start with is is not, uh, uh, you know, not a, not n not from the theoretical viewpoint, but experimentally. Okay. So so experimentally, how uh, how do we uh, you know, basically peer into a crystal and find out what's in there, right? So, so how, what do we do, you know, experimentally? You so say you have a material, how do we find out? What's the basic idea behind finding out how amorphous or how crystalline or how polycrystalline things are? Yeah, so you do X-ray diffraction or essentially the key word I want to get is diffraction. Yeah, so so and there are all kinds of diffraction. Right? So uh, the, the game is really you're going to take the material, whatever thin film or, or you know, layer structure you're looking at, okay, and you take it and then uh, uh, the, 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 you know, 
in, in a way, uh, this is called by many names, but uh, it's, it's, the idea is completely pervasive. It, it, it's irrespective of, of, of the method you're using. Right? So you have a block of things, and you want to find out whether the atoms are arranged nicely, whether it's a solid, whether it's a liquid, whether it's a gas. Right? I mean, let's say it's a, you know, you're given some sort of a black box, and you want to find out what's inside there. So, I mean, any, uh, I think intuitively we know in order to find out what's in there, you have to basically when we see something, for example, we're looking at the light that's scattered off. So essentially, it's a you have to do a scattering experiment. You have to throw stuff at it. Whatever comes back or you know, it bounces off it, from that, you have to reconstruct what's inside there. Right? So that's the generic idea. Right? It's, a, it's a scattering experiment. So, uh, so you kind of you, you throw something at it, and then you know, stuff comes out. Uh, and uh, you know, OK, so, so uh, there, be, you can set it up in a reflection geometry. And you put a screen here, right? This is very generic, and X-ray happens to be one of them, right? So it's a very generic picture. Uh, and then you look at the screen, and uh, depending upon what you see, you might see you know, a set of discrete points at which this stuff comes out. Or you might see a kind of a haze. Or you might see you know, something in between, you know, some, something like that. You might see rings. You, can, you have all these various th kinds of stuff that might come out, right? So, uh, now, uh, so, so that would be a reflect, reflection uh, geometry for an experiment like that, right? Uh, where, where you're reflecting of things, right? Uh, and I think you also know that uh, for reasonably thin films, uh, or uh, you know, if you're looking at, uh, okay, let me, let me say that this is, uh, so, so for a reasonably uh, thin film, you can even do, uh, you know, shoot something and look at, put the screen over here, right? Put a screen over here and see what's, what you know, basically stuff that went through it, right? right? So, so that's a transmission geometry, right? So, uh, one of the main, main questions we are really pondering about right now is is uh, how ordered are the you know atoms inside or the constituents? How ordered are they, right? And and the moment we have. Uh, 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 you know something that we expect to be periodic, right? Uh, I think we realize right away what should I be using to shoot at it? Something that has a wavelength. I mean, because a wave is a this is a grating for a wave. Right? It's periodic grating. When a wave goes through, there will be diffraction, right? Right, and that's the ba basic game, right? So we we want to shoot it with a wave, and not so much a particle, but a wave. Right? That that's what we want to do, right? And then similarly here, uh, we want to. Uh, you know, use a wave, and we want to kind of fig that will tell us information about things like periodicity and, and all that stuff, right? So this idea is obviously trivial to us now, but uh, you know, in early 1900s, it was not not well known. I mean, people didn't know that there were atoms. You know, there, obviously there were hypotheses, but nobody had ever seen them, right? Uh, and and uh, uh, and I think experimentally, you know that. Uh, uh, X-ray was discovered completely by accident, right? And and then uh, uh, it was not used uh, for, to to image crystals for a reasonably long time, you know. Uh, and it was used primarily to to image, you know, look through stuff, right? And and uh, uh, image bones and all that stuff. And then uh, uh, you know, a few people uh, had had the idea that uh, uh, one way to figure out whether a crystal indeed has a periodic arrangement of atoms is to use X-rays and bounce off a crystal. I mean, they had just the idea, had the idea, and the experiment was done, you know, very soon after that. And indeed, they saw the first refraction spots. And uh, uh, I think it's 1905, 1908, or something like that. Uh, uh, and and uh, so that was the X-ray. So you can have X X-ray diffraction. That's obviously. Uh, uh, clear where it can have that, and the reason it works is because uh, so typical lattice constants are of the order of angstroms, right? And the X-ray wavelength is also of the order of angstroms, and that's obviously a key feature that uh, that that your wavelength must be of the order of the diffraction pattern here, in order to diffract. Otherwise, it's not going to see it, right? Just like electron waves. You know, when the wavelength of electrons becomes equal to the lattice constant, you form the band gaps. It diffracts. It forms standing waves, right? Exactly in the same way, you have to be of the order of the, uh, you know, lattice constant in order to have the extra diffraction. That's I think you know that, but I, you know, just uh, um, kind of uh, stating uh, it again. 
But uh, so X-ray is a photon, which is a boson, right? How does it interact with the crystal? It's a photon, right? So how does it interact? How does it see the atoms in the first place? Right? Is, uh, it's light, right? How is it interacting? Right, so, so light has the oscillating electric field and magnetic field. And the electric field goes in and you have the atoms which have electron clouds and nuclei, right? And it sloshes the electron clouds and all that. So it, it obviously uh, now has a strong coupling to the uh, electric field and all that, right? So. Uh, now, you don't have to choose X-ray. Uh, you can choose electrons, actually. You can choose electrons and bounce electrons off the surface. Okay, and I think we uh, know very well that uh, this was uh, an experiment in 1920s, uh, which was the Davis and Germer experiment, where they basically were shooting electrons at a nickel crystal, and when they looked outside, actually to their very big surprise, they see spots rather than a haze. You know? so, so, right? so, so that was the first experimental proof called the Davis and Germer experiment that electrons have wa wavelength, that, that matter has, has wave and that's you know, one of the confirmations of de Broglie relation and quantum mechanics in general. Right? So, so, uh, so you can shoot electrons and we, uh, for example, in the growth of compound semiconductors, this is used very often in a geometry, co I'll, I'll discuss this li a little bit more detail when we talk about growth later, crystal growth. So it's used in a geometry called reflection, high energy, electron diffraction, read. Uh, during crystal growth, you can, it's very useful because as you are growing a crystal, you can bounce electrons off and see what's going on, what's for the surface as you grow it, you know, as you grow it. You can count how many atomic layers you have put in, you can stop after two layers, and that's how you grow quantum wells accurately. So that's uh, you're bouncing electrons off, off, off of this. Yeah. Uh, you could do X-ray too, but for that you need a very intense X-ray source, very intense X-ray source, uh, and uh, that thing is generally not a laptop or a you know a simple lab experiment. But if you have a synchrotron source, then you can do X-ray while growing, and then, and that's what's done in chess here uh, in in the uh, you know the uh, Cornell High Energy synchrotron source, right? So so they actually have. Uh, the electron ring and a positron ring and they accelerate it to close speed of light and it starts emitting all wavelengths but you filter out the x-rays right? and then you have an MBE system or a growth system in which you are growing crystal and you kind of are starting to bounce this stuff. It's really really interesting. Actually, yeah. So, so uh, um, now uh, so you can shoot electrons, uh, you can shoot x-rays, uh, uh, x-rays a photon can consider it to be pretty much light, right? Uh, it's, it's not very different. Uh, and uh, what else can you do? What else can you use to bounce off here? Example, yeah. Neutrons. Neutrons. That's a great, great, uh, uh, you know. Uh, so neutrons. Uh, so what will that give us, right? Neutrons have no charge, right? So, so, so they will not interact so much with the, you know, uh, electromagnetically, right? But they will interact. How? How will they couple? So it's a, it has mass, obviously, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it has mass, and either from uh, mostly from the nucleus, right? It's going to collide nucleus and reflect. But the nice thing about neutrons is all, it also has wavelength. It's a you know, uh, it's, it, everything has a wavelength, but the neutron wavelength you can control and you can bounce off. What is neutron scattering used for measuring? For example, what what is it typically used for measuring? So yeah, you have an idea. Yeah. So, uh, so we, I'm going to discuss this now. It's actually uh, one of the very interesting things that. Uh, uh, so neutron scattering you can use uh, because it's mass related. You know, you can measure mechanical properties of the crystal using neutron scattering. And one of the most important mechanical properties of a crystal is are its phonon modes. You know, the phonon dispersion. Remember earlier we, f we discussed how do you get the electron dispersion, right? See the angle resolve photoelectron spectroscopy and you know, take the crystal, have light incident and you turn it and you see where you, you're plucking out electrons, right? Similarly, when you have a crystal, let's discuss this a little bit. Right. So uh, t uh, two major things that I'm going to mention for semiconductors, neutron scattering will give you a phonon dispersion or uh, and it will also give you uh, uh, the second topic I'm not going to discuss much, 
but I just should mention it at this point, that if you have a crystal uh, which has a certain magnetic order, meaning a ferromagnet or antiferromagnet, so if you have spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, and so on, right? that's an antiferromagnet, for example. So when you, uh, you basically when you scatter the neutron off, you can choose the neutron. Uh, neutron is also a fermion; it has spin. Right? It has no charge, right? but it has spin. So you can choose it to have a certain spin, and then you can bounce it off, and you can find out the spin structure of this crystal. So that's how you identify within the crystal whether something is ferromagnetic or antiferromagnetic. What is the order of it? You know, how are the arrangements? What is the lattice constant of the spin? You see the la spin lattice constant here in this antiferromagnet is twice that of the physical electronic lattice constant. Do you see that? Just because. So you can kind of get all this information from neutron scattering. So. And there are a lot of other things you can do in neutron scattering. Uh, so let's see the spin structure of the crystal. Can right? uh, be a spin order. Right? Uh, just like you get a phonon dispersion, you can also get if you have a spin wave. You know, instead of you know very clear things, you have maybe have uh, spins that are going you know like that, and it switches. You know, it, it has a wave like nature. It's going through a wave. You can also detect that. You know, the spin wave uh, dispersions using neutron scattering. So that's kind of a nice thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can. You, one might ask, can you do that with electrons? The answer is it's very much more difficult because the electron, the the spin-spin interaction here is enabled because this thing has no neutron has no charge. The moment you have charge, so the charge-charge interaction is way stronger than the spin-spin interaction. That's why this is preferred to look at spin. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then in the same way, uh, the charge-charge interaction uh, is, is uh, so, so, you know, typically uh, read an electron diffraction has not yet been used uh, a lot to figure out phonons, uh, but in principle you have to be very sensitive and you can potentially use it. So either x-ray or uh, you can use these as well to figure out phonons, but typically neutrons are preferred. Why? Because they have no electro, direct electromagnetic interaction with the lattice because they have no charge. Right? Okay, so uh, we're going to just uh, very briefly uh, uh, talk about, uh, okay, so, so that was the reflection mode. I'm going to talk about the phonon aspect, but let's just look at the transmission mode. Again, uh, uh, transmission mode, uh, w typically what is uh, done, I think you know, is the transmission uh, uh, electron microscopy, where you're shooting electrons at thin, very thin layers, right? And, and then it diffracts with the grating of the crystal and it produces spots. And from these spots, uh, and we're going to look at this today, uh, if your you know, lattice looks uh, like you know, some function in real space that is a periodic function, then this will have uh, uh, you know, essentially this quantity here that you measure on the screen is just the Fourier transform of that. We're going to look at that today. Okay? And obviously, if you, can, if you have the Fourier transform, you can reconstruct the whole thing again. And you can have the image of the atoms in themselves of the lattice. right? So, so that's the TEM or transmission electron microscopy. Uh, I think you can obviously do some of these other experiments in, in the transmission mode as well, but uh, uh, I think you, also you see that uh, uh, you need to control the wavelength of electrons both in the TEM and in the read, such that the wavelength is of the order of the lattice constant, right? So that, that, that part you also understand. And I think you also know that uh, the wavelength of uh, electrons uh, uh, is, is given by the de Broglie relation H over momentum, right? Planck's, uh, so wavelength of electrons is given by Planck's constant by the momentum, right, of the electron. And what is the momentum? Let's say you, are, you have created these electrons using two you know, um, uh, electrodes and you have accelerated the electron to a certain uh, velocity uh, or speed uh, to a certain kilo electron volt. So you actually, what you, you do control is the uh, kinetic energy of the electron, so it, it will be of the order of whatever you know electron voltage you have used to accelerate it, right? So as a result, this thing basically is very simple. In the end, it looks like two m zero. Uh, let's write it electron charge as Q times V, right? So that gives you, you know, if you want to have your wavelength of the order of angstroms, you you, know, you choose your voltage because everything else is fixed here. Planck's constant charge, mass of electron, right? And what voltages do you typically use, for example? How much will give you about, you know, say 0.3 angstrom or something like that? 
you have an idea. Yeah, uh, basically, t you know, tens of kilovolts or a few kilovolts. So if you, you can do the numbers here, a few, uh, few kilovolts would give you, you know, a sub angstrom wavelength for electrons. You know? So, so that, that's how you're using it for diffraction measurement. Yeah. Is that clear? Okay. So, uh, so and in the transmission mode, I think you can see uh, that uh, there, uh, what you are going to see is not just the. Uh, so in the reflection highlight, in the read process, you are actually what you're doing is kind of bouncing it off at a very small angle, whereas here you're kind of going through X-ray. You are it's not small angle; it's all kinds of angles now. Okay, so uh, let me uh, briefly talk about the phonon part, and then we will uh, discuss the, uh, mathematically what is this quantity. We are going to quantify this whole thing now, and then develop this idea of you know correlation lengths and structure factors and all that 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 give you the the uh, you know this this picture we're going to develop, and that's the idea that I was saying is completely general to all scattering experiments, no matter what problem you're looking at. You know, so, so it's a general idea. So uh, the phonon part, I'll just uh, kind of mention that right now. Uh, so a perfect crystal, I think we realize is is uh, uh, so. Let me. This is discussion is primarily about phonon dispersion and how we first of all what are phonons and and then how do we measure them, right? Uh, of a crystal, for dispersion of a crystal. So, uh, so if you have a perfect lattice uh, of atoms, uh, in fact, let me look at the most simplest case, which is a 1D lattice, uh, and you have, you know, the basis uh, or the lattice points are arranged periodically, and the idea is there's a basis. Let's choose the simplest basis. There's only one atom, right, in the basis. <laughs> Now, uh, so the lattice constant or the distance between each of them is uh, constant for all, and that's the definition of the periodicity of the lattice, right? A naught for all, right? and it's, let's assume it's infinite. Now, uh, what is a phonon? Just like we, I just briefly mentioned that spin does not need to be completely periodic; it can kind of cant and, and do do all kinds of waves, right? So wave. So the phonon is actually a is is, is a mechanical wave, as you. Uh, also, I might have seen multiple times, uh, but what I want to kind of uh, point out is is a, uh, a very interesting property of of of, of phonons, uh, or rather, uh, how you can guarantee that there will be phonons in, in, in you know of, of certain kinds in, in, in certain crystals. So so, uh, and then this is a very powerful argument that comes from from um, basically the ideas of mathematical ideas of broken symmetry and things like that. So if you take an atom, for example, just one atom, right? Uh, and and then uh, 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 that has infinite. Uh, let's say we take a simple atom which has, you know, hydrogen atom or something like that, and it, it has infinite uh, symmetry. Meaning you can, if your atom is here or it's there or there, or you rotate it or you tilt it, whatever, it looks exactly the same, right? So uh, uh, and then uh, you can imagine if all these atoms are very very far apart, right? Very very far apart. They all have that, you know, uh, w what you can call as as a continuous symmetry. You know, you can move it continuously and all that. Right? It has a continuous symmetry. You can move it continuously. If it's a single atom, you can turn it uh, and do whatever you want. So all of them are continuous. It's not discrete. It's not like I have to move it by a finite length and then it looks the same again. It's not discrete. It's a continuous symmetry. Okay? So. There is a theorem, uh, uh, and it's, it's actually a very general theorem in mathematics as well as in, you know, in general all fields, uh, that uh, whenever you have a continuous symmetry, uh, if you have a continuous symmetry which is broken by whatever means, if you break a continuous symmetry, you're going to, you're guaranteed to have something because of each broken continuous symmetry, you know, be it translation, be it rotation, be it whatever. Because of each of these, there will be, uh, let me just write it this way, it's, uh, there will be uh, modes of the whole crystal, or, you know, where uh, uh, essentially, okay, so, so they'll be basically at, let me write it this way. Collective modes. 
and it, it may if it seems a little abstract I'll make it very you know um, solid right now. so any broken continuous symmetry will give you uh, collective excitation modes that are that have zero energy they start from zero energy you know. and it turns out that the, the you know the acoustic phonon is just one of those modes it's just one of those modes uh, how does it come about is this clear I mean at least the abstract picture is clear that if you have a continuous symmetry and you for, by whatever process you have broken it right then you will end up with a zero energy mode which is a collective mode meaning instead of one this symmetry was for each atom. Let's look at it quantitatively now. So if I, I just discussed it, if I have one atom, it has continuous symmetry in all senses. You can translate it, you can rotate it, you can do whatever, right? And then if they're far apart, all of them have it, uh, and, and, and then, uh, so they all have continuous symmetry. But now, once I form this crystal, right? You see, you have formed the crystal now, right? So you have broken all kinds of symmetries right away. You can see that, right? In, in a 1D crystal, for example. Right? What is clearly obvious is, what's the most obvious thing right away is this translation symmetry in this direction, it still has translation symmetry, right? It still has translation symmetry, meaning if I have an infinite crystal, I can move the whole thing by a lattice constant A0, right? And it comes back to itself. But it is not continuous anymore. Meaning, it's not like I can move it by infinitely small distance, and it still comes back. It's, it's not like that anymore, right? So, what we say here is that the continuous symmetry of translation has been broken. As a result, because of continue, uh, because of translation and motion, you are guaranteed to have a zero energy collective mode here. You know, a mode where the whole thing is vibrating collectively, right? And the thing starts from zero energy. The 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 cost for you to excite those vibrations is zero. That's the meaning of it. And, and, and uh, what, what does that mean uh, what, uh, in, in terms of figures? And I'll, I'll basically now, this is a motivation for the next topic, which is uh, you know, the, how do we track these things. So essentially, if I take the lattice and uh, uh, say that, well, I, I, I have a vibration of this atom by this much, this atom by a little more, this atom by you know, a little less, and, and so you can see I can create a wave of the vibrations, right? So this doesn't move. So I have a wave form now that goes zero displacement, little bit of a displacement, little bit more displacement, less, you know, less, and, and then zero, right? So, so you can see now the vibrations, which is the location of the atom of the jade side, is doing a wave now, right? Yeah, right. This makes sense. So, so the, it's, it's going as a wave. This particular mode would be called the acoustic phonon mode. Uh, it, this, is a, this, this mode is a phonon. And the dispersion, when you do a neutron scattering experiment, you can measure the whole thing. You know. Meaning, the wave has a wavelength, and every wave has a wavelength. And, 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 and the Q is 2 pi over the wavelength. And what we are now plotting is how much energy does it take to excite a mode like this for vibration. Right? How much energy does it cost you to excite a vibration like that? Does that make sense? I mean, that's what we are plotting. And when you do a neutron scattering experiment, you basically will have the neutrons come in, and it will uh, the wavelength of the neutron when it matches the wavelength of this phonon, you will get a blip here, you know, right? because it's mass scattering against mass, but the mass is going as a wave now. Does it make sense? I mean, the, this is a mass density wave. Does that make sense? I mean, this is, so. Some regions are compressed, some regions are, are dilated, and all, I mean, so this is stretched out a little bit. For example, this is compressed and stretched out, and, and that, that sort of thing. So, so there's a mass density wave that's going, and therefore a f neutron, which is also has mass, scatters of it. it. Mass and a wavelength scatters. Any wave will scatter, of, in th that wave scatters of this wave, this diffraction and all that again, right? So you get a blip. And you can reconstruct the whole blips all, 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 you know, uh, by changing the wavelength and the angle, just like you do in RPES. You change the crystal structure orientation. And then what you uh, get is, is the phonon dispersion uh, is, is, is uh, I think you may have seen this, is, is going to kind of look uh, like that. And then if you have two atoms in a, oh, okay, so if you have a uni, one atom unit cell, then that's your phonon dispersion. So you can see uh, what you are guaranteed is this thing is going to start from zero. That is guaranteed by the, you know, um, so this, this, this idea, at least in physics contest, is called the uh, 
you know, uh, Nambu or you know, spontaneously broken symmetry or, or Nambu. This is called a Goldstone mode in general. You know, so uh, acoustic phonon is basically a Goldstone boson. It is phonon is a boson, and it looks like that. So that, that that's how it looks. The slope here. This is the energy cost. Here's Q. So if you want to generate a very long wavelength phonon, it costs you very little energy. That's the meaning of it. The slope of this, what is that? Do you, do you know what that is? Velocity. Yeah, the velocity. And uh, physically, what is it? For example, if you take this solid, do this experiment, and measure this, physically, it actually, sorry? Yeah. So it's related to thermal conductivity, but actually, it's the sound velocity. The velocity of sound to propagate in the crystal. The sound is a mechanical wave. Right, and 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 the uh, it has long wavelength compared to the at atomic sites and crystal, so that's why it's called the acoustic phonon. You know? So uh, to do with sound, right, acoustic phonon. And uh, I'm not deriving the formulas, but essentially, if you think of it as springs and masses, you can really show very clearly what what that thing is. You know, the dispersion will look like sine of Q A, but at small Q Qs, it will be linear, and your Phonon energy at small k's or small q's is h bar times, I think this is something you did in your uh, second assignment on DOS. Uh, and the sound is a wave, so it has, you know, the frequency is just the velocity of sound, uh, velocity of sound times q. You know, this linear, it's a linear dispersion, just like light. Instead of speed of light, you have speed of sound. So, so, so this is something you can measure. Uh, experimentally by neutron <coughs> by neutron diffraction uh, neutron scattering and then the, the guys who developed it uh, uh, Brockhaus and others they were uh, for for uh, uh, very deservedly they were awarded the Nobel Prize they developed it for silicon and metals and all that so the guys who developed this method of neutron scattering so uh, now if you have two two distinct atoms you know a and B and a and B for example then I think you, you realize you, you have a, what's another mode here uh, uh, because of symmetry considerations. This is not the Goldstone mode. This is not this sort of mode. The, that mode is here. But you have another mode that's called the optical mode, optical phonon mode. And uh, again, in the neutron scattering, you can basically, if you, when you do the scattering as a function of energy, you will see a blip here. You see another blip here. You know? so, so you can de re reconstruct the entire dispersion curve that way. To phonon on this question. Yeah. Uh, that we can, uh, there are many ways, but uh, so thermal neutrons uh, sometimes related to nuclear reactions, uh, where neutrons are basically ejected from nuclear reactions and such. But probably there are many other ways, and I think yeah, yeah, we can look look it up. But I mean, nuclear reaction would be a clear way to do it, except you have to. Yeah, I mean, it's not a very small laptop experiment anymore, lab experiment, but you need to use the facility. Typically, uh, neutron scattering is done in major facilities where, you know, uh, it's just not something that is easily done in, 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 in labs, at least t not till today. Okay, so, okay, so, so uh, um, uh, is, is that at least, uh, I think, qual qualitatively what, what I was trying to get through is, and I think uh, what I'm, the reason I went through this process is uh, uh, this idea as well, you know, this idea of uh, continuous symmetry breaking will lead to zero energy collective modes is a very pervasive idea. In fact, uh, it goes all the way. Uh, I mean, it related to super. It started from superconductivity, and then you know, Higgs boson. All of them are basically related to this idea. And so, so, uh, uh, and, and and exceptions to the rule. You know, there are there will be some exceptions, and and then that that will lead to all kinds of new quasi particles. You know. Here. It's you know, phonon is really not a particle, but you can see it's, it's we are thinking of it as a particle now, just like one photon. And the nice thing is when you do measurements, the whole collective oscillations and sloshing does show up as a as a one particle. It has properties of a particle, which is why these are called quasi particles. Okay, so uh, so now what we want to do is is quantify this. Uh, uh, so that idea is pervasive, and obviously this idea of scattering. Uh, uh, of one wave uh, from another periodic grating is, is very pervasive, right? And it, it is not just for, for crystallography, but many other things. So, so, yeah. Okay, so let's look at this idea a little bit in more detail uh, and make it more quantitative now. So what we are going to do is, is uh, uh, 
uh, look at uh, you know any general experiment uh, where uh, what what, what we're going to do is uh, you know try to quantify that exper that 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 sort of measurement. What I want to do is develop uh, because what you're going to do in the experiment is you're going to get some data based on the you know points that you measure and all that, and from there you want to reconstruct what's in there. Right? You want to reconstruct what's in there, and then so let's start from. We, we are going to develop this process in the reverse way. We start from what's in here, and from there, can I identify that? Right. That's that's what we're going to do. And I think you know that uh, the the experiment is is you know relatively straightforward. I don't want to go through the derivation of Bragg's law and all that stuff. But essentially, the game is you you have a plane wave of electrons or photons or neutrons, whatever. Right. Any any wave, you have a plane wave. You know, with planes uh, like that incident on this. And it bounces off; it scatters off here, and you're looking at what's coming out, right? And uh, uh, why why does it diffract? Because if you have, for example, crystal planes like that, along this direction, this path length and that path length is obviously different, right? And it's a wave, and it's propagating in free space. Oh, sorry, or in any space, matter space. Uh, and then whenever phase move, uh, wave moves by a distance uh, r, uh, if uh, if a wave moves by a distance uh, say x, then uh, if you know its wavelength, uh, so so that will be you know q times x. Q is the two pi by the wavelength, right? And that defines a phase, right? Right? And what you do is you multiply by i, right? And do e to the power i, right? That's how much phase has changed because of that extra that the length as you, as the wave propagates, right? And so now you have two two paths. One path one has say amplitude one. Uh, with uh, uh, phase i, q has not changed, x1, and path 2 has a2, i, x2, right? So you're going to add the phase, but you never measure the phase. What you measure is the intensity, which is the square, right? So there's, that's the whole game of diffraction in, in like one line, right? I mean, that's what it is. So, so when you sum this all, I think you, you know you're going to get, uh, you know, a squared, and, you know, there, there's some constants. Basically, you'll get some constants uh, plus. Uh, uh, let's, for simplicity, just assume that the the coefficients or the amplitudes are the same. Uh, so, so what you end up kind of getting is two times a cosine of q x1 minus x2. Uh, you know, so something like that, right? So you have a constant part and you have an oscillatory part, right? Right? And and that oscillatory part is is the stuff that you know is is going to be oscillatory. Uh, in so if 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 things are periodic in real space, uh, uh, they will also be periodic in Q space. Makes sense. So that that's that's the whole meaning. As I change the wavelength, if stuff is periodic in real space, obviously it's also going to become periodic in this space. Cosine is cosine function or any of these oscillatory functions agnostic to what's sitting here or there. You can keep one fix, change the other, you'll be periodic. Keep this fix, that change the other, it'll still be periodic, right? And then so that's your real space, that's Fourier space, and then that's the whole game. I mean that's what we're doing. So in a crystal, this particular path length difference uh, is is uh, I think you can see that uh, 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 the uh, uh, from the math I think you get the Bragg's law, right? That the that the uh, uh, that the, the extra distance that uh, this particular wave has to travel, uh, and it will scatter off always a lattice point or a lattice plane. Right? It will always scatter off a lattice plane. Right? So the extra distance is clearly related to the spacing of the lattice, uh, the extra distance. Right? This is clearly related to the some sort of a uh, real space uh, con lattice constant right? that we started out with today. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, uh, the peaks and all that, or zeros that will occur the separation of the peaks and zeros in Q space will be related to this. And there will basically be, the end game of it is it's going to be 2 pi by the reciprocal lattice vector. That's where this is going to appear. That's the game. So, yeah. OK, so, uh, uh, and then, you know, the Bragg's law specifically is for plane wave scattering. And you get, you know, this, uh, the, the, you know, the, the uh, you can see the Q, uh, what, what are we calling as Q here? Is really the difference of incident and and reflected wave. So k k is the two pi by wavelength times the that vector, and this is two pi by wavelength. This vector magnitudes are the same, but the direction has changed. 
So this vector, you know, minus that vector is kind of a vector like that. That's Q. Right? This makes sense. So that's Q, and uh, uh, and Q dot R R is going to be always a real, you know, a lattice parameter. So that's that's really uh, whenever uh, Q dot R is uh, two pi times an integer, right? Uh, you, you basically get a peak, right? cosine of zero, right? You get a large number, uh, and uh, I, I think from here you see that uh, there are specific cues for which it will happen, that's kind of inverse of R, and I think you know that if I have uh, uh, my real space lattice vectors A1, A2, and A3 as the real space lattice vectors, uh, you know, the smallest ones, then uh, in general uh, the instead of I mean it's a vector product it's a dot product so I do, don't just take it here you you know that in Q space in real space this will be the real space that's vectors in Q space what will you get you will get basically three other vectors b2 and b3 with units of one over length right these are the reciprocal lattice vectors and how is for example what is b1 how do you find that right so uh, again, I mean, depend on, so, so generally you can write it in uh, 2 pi, but, but uh, essentially, yeah, okay, B1 will be a cross product of these two, right, divided by a uh, triple product of all three, so you can take A1 dot A2 cross A3, right? And uh, it just cycle through the rest, okay, so, right? So if A1, A2, A3 are all... Uh, equal in length in a cubic crystal, for example, then you see you get 2 pi by a dimensionally, and it's, that's 2 pi by lattice constant. Okay, so, okay. so, uh, so why did I write that? Because basically now Q, uh, whenever Q is, you know, uh, Q is like m uh, times b1 plus n times b2 plus you know some other uh, cons integer times b3, you get a huge, you, you'll get a peak. Do you see that from here? Whenever Q, in Q space now, right? after you scatter, so, so you get a peak now. Right? So, so if your peaks in real space are at these points, in reciprocal space they are at these points, and all the integers of that. So that that's the game. So uh, uh, what we are going to uh, just do in the last 10 minutes is just quantify this a little more. I think you are very well aware of what I just spoke. This You may have seen it multiple times. But any questions here before we move? Okay, so let's quantify it furthermore. And now what I'm going to do is, is uh, 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 say that uh, what is really uh, scattering the you know, photon, x-ray, or, uh, or uh, uh, the neutron, or electron, whatever. So what is really scattering are the, the atoms uh, and the constituents of either the nuclei for neutrons or you know, electron clouds for photons or electrons, right? So that's what's scattering them. So what we are going to now say is, is uh, 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 we are going to qu quantify now that an atom uh, with its electron cloud and its nucleus uh, has, uh, we are going to right now keep it somewhat, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're not going to say exactly what, what it is, whether it's the charge density, whether it's the mass density, or something like that, you know, some parameter, either related to mass or to charge. Okay? Uh, and we're going to call that quantity as f of r. Okay. This is a function of r. Right? So, so you, you, uh, you attach the origin to the atom cent nuclear center, and then around it, there's a certain function. That could be the charge density right? around it. It could be the mass density. It could be something like that. Right? So, so that's f of r. That function completely captures my uh, atom uh, and its capability to scatter off whatever is coming in from there. Right? Does this make sense? Okay. So physically, this function math mathematically is capturing the uh, properties of the atom for scattering. Right. So uh, now uh, the question is, uh, how do we? So that's that's, uh, and then we're going to just uh, look at uh, a single atom, and uh, you can think of it now as a attached to a origin. You can attach an origin anywhere, and and it has a location, right? It has a location. If it was the origin, it would be f of r. But if the it's off from the origin, let's say at r j, then it's the same function, but it's just shifted by r j, right? It's just sitting somewhere else. 
right? Okay, so, so that's that's what's going to scatter, uh, you know, uh, my photons or electrons or neutrons, whichever ones I'm choosing. So this is real space x, y, and z. Right? Obviously, I'm not interested in one atom. I'm going to now put it all atoms together, right? But how you put it together is now the interesting question. So uh, you can have. Uh, I'm going to represent the atoms by points now. Uh, so uh, I can have a situation where I have atoms that are completely randomly completely randomly located, right? Uh, I can have a situation where they are uh, randomly located and very far apart. Uh, or I can have uh, uh, atoms where they're very close to each other but still randomly located, right? There's no order to it. I can have that. Or I can have a crystal where they are perfectly ordered, right? I can have all these quantities now and what I want to show is mathematically how do you capture this and what is the difference mathematically between them, right? Uh, using this function. And I think you know, for example, what parameter I'm going to, or what function I'm going to derive from here. Have you had courses? Yeah. So, uh, have you heard of the structure factor? Uh, probably in, in some courses. So essentially we're going to derive that, but I, that, you know, all these dispersion curves and all that really are uh, a picture of the structure factor. So we're going to motivate that right now. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, so this functional form uh, of, of whatever object is, is, is go going on, so the total, total uh, you can call it as a field. It's typically called as a field because this idea is so pervasive, you know, in field theories and all that, you know, quantum field theories, same deal. It's a field. A field is a sum of all the individual elements here, you know, scattering power of each of these point particles. The field is a sum. I think it's very clear what I'm hopefully I'm saying uh, is, is uh, the total field is, oh, sorry, minus rj. That's clear, right? Uh, if I have, instead of one atom, I have 10 to the power 20, right? You, you sum the whole thing, right? That's, that's, that's the total, uh, uh, you know, uh, scattering capability of this, or I'm going to just refer to this as the field. This is the total field for scattering. And the wave is going to scatter off this field. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what you see right away is uh, uh, I'll have, uh, you know, if I have a random origin, you know, uh, randomness here, so there'll be Rj, let's define another point, you know, Rk, and so on. You know, so, so you have all these different points that are locating the, the, uh, uh, the individual elements here. So let's say I have my first thing, let's say I'm looking at a gas, okay? gas of atoms. Okay, so uh, I think you know that uh, uh, if I have two atoms and I'm trying to bring them close to each other, I think we started some of the early parts of this course this way as well, if I have two atoms uh, and I'm trying to bring them close to each other uh, and I'm going to plot based on the distance between two atoms the, the, the distance between two atoms, let's call it L, you know, just to avoid multiple uses of the same parameters here. I want to uh, plot how much energy does it cost you? How much energy do you have to provide to push these atoms together? Right? Right? So I'm going to plot that energy. Right? How does it look? Right? So, so I think you all know then, so it, it actually does this, right? Right, and and uh, I'm not getting the details of why. I mean, I think you realize that when they're very close, you know, the nu the nuclei start repelling and the electrons start repelling each other and that sort of thing. I mean, there are all these things, and then the far apart. So there are all these Leonard Jones sort of picture for this, right? So um, details, but this quantity where the minimum occurs, what is this called you know, for two atoms? That's that's basically the bond length, right? I mean, if you have hydrogen atom. This is the distance between two hydrogen atoms in the gas, H2, right, or O2, or N2, right? This is the distance. So it's typically you know, uh, less than an angstrom or, or, or so. It's the distance between the two atoms, right? And the same deal, I think, you can see in the crystal. So the crystal will have all the minima. This is the lattice constant of the crystal. Right? So this thing is, is basically A0, uh, something like that. 
uh, and uh, uh, so so this with this picture, uh, I think you can see that uh, I'm going to gen generically call a naught as the you know lattice constant. Obviously, a gas has no lattice constant, right? But if it was a hydrogen at monoatomic gas, and if you were to form a hydrogen molecule, then lattice constant would be the distance between the two atoms. That's what I mean by that. Lattice. So I think if it, if I have a gas, you can right away see that if I take R i or sorry R j, some vector and another R k, and I take an absolute value squared, how will it compare to the distance of two a naught? If I have a kind of a rarefied gas. So it will be much larger, right? Then you know, they're really far apart. Does it make sense? So, so the distance between two points is like much larger than a naught squared. Does that make sense? What I'm saying. So instead of hydrogen, let's say I, I'm going to talk about oxygen or, or nitrogen. Let's look at nitrogen. Okay. I, I was talking about nitrogen. I can take nitrogen, take it below 77 Kelvin, and it becomes a liquid, right? So you have LN2 or liquid nitrogen now, right? Now what happens? So what does Ri minus RK, Rj minus Rk look like in a liquid? So in a liquid, it's almost the same order as the lattice constant of a solid. Mm -hmm. For example, when you take water, it becomes ice. The volume change is not like a factor of 10. It's very small. It's a very small change. So that, as a result, you know that in a liquid, your distance is actually of the order rk, ri minus rj, you know, whole squared is of the order of a naught squared. Not very different. It's very close, but slightly larger, slightly larger in liquid. Uh, and what about in a crystal? So what is rj minus rk whole squared? Now I'm going to not write approximation anymore. I, I know it exactly. What is it? Yeah, it's basically a squared times a naught squared times an integer, always, always an integer, precise, right? So that's the major difference right away. You can see, right? So you have a gas or a random located liquid or solid. So uh, a crystal, uh, it, it's always go it's going to be n times a naught squared if it's perfect. If it deviates from this n, you know there's some imperfection. That's, that's what I'm trying to get to. Right? OK. So a liquid has analogies. It's a close, reasonably close-packed structure of atoms. But it, it, is, it's a, it has analogy for solids with amorphous semiconductors, amorphous, where there's no order of these. But still, they're very close to each other. The lattice constant is about the same as a perfect crystal. That's an amorphous crystal. Okay? In a perfect crystal, you'll have this, but you can have situations where a region of this atoms is perfectly crystalline. Another region is also a perfect crystal in, inside here, but the crystal orientation is different. Right? So you can have that. So this is not amorphous. This would be called a polycrystalline material. There are many crystals okay, of, of different orientation. So that's polycrystalline. So uh, polycrystalline is very different from amorphous, as you can see. Amorphous has no order. right? And then that's the quantity. That's what I want to quantify next. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see. So I think we are running up, up against time now. Uh, what I'll uh, do now is, uh, so, so the, the quantity that really quantifies all this stuff is the structure factor. It's one formula for all of that, right? And then this idea is, uh, uh, as I, I, you know, uh, what, what I mentioned is it's extremely pervasive, meaning it, it goes across all fields of research, really. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is take this field and sum them, and obviously all that information, whether it's, it's a gas, whether it's amorphous, uh, polycrystalline, or perfect crystal, is buried inside the sum, right? It's all there, right? So you've got to figure out how to get it. And, and uh, the, I, I'll summarize the main result, uh, is, is, uh, uh, and, and then uh, the next time we're going to uh, look at it in, in greater detail, right? So you're going to sum it like that. That's your field, all right? And uh, 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 because it's interacting with the wave, and I think I already mentioned, I think I raised it, you know, you, you, whenever you have a f wave interacting with matter, the phase of it is buried in the Q. So you, that's why you go to the Fourier space to look at what, how is a wave interacting with this matter. Right? So you take the field, and you look at its Fourier transform now to find out 
how is it going to interact with wavelength of wave, you know, two, 2 pi by wavelength is q. So I want to go to q space now right, to look at how is this thing going to scatter. After things scatter, after I bounce off stuff from here, how will the pattern look? And basically the pattern will look closely related to phi of q, which is the Fourier space. Essentially, it's a Fourier transform on the right-hand side. So the, what was the Fourier transform? Well, uh, the sum remains, but then you get an integral of over space e to the power i q dot r. I, you could do it in one dimension. I'm just going to write a general case now, r minus rj. Right? Right. So, so that's, that's really uh, uh, your field in Fourier space. Right? When you image it, when you count the number of electrons on a screen or a number of photons, extra photons on a screen in a photo uh, extra detector, you're not, you're not finding this. What you're counting is the number of photons which is the intensity. So you're measuring mod square of this. That's what you're really measuring in experiments yeah. when you're doing counting of, of, of photons. You know, so. so if you track the phase and all that, then you get other information. But right now, I'm just saying that. And, and, and this essentially is, is uh, uh, um, OK. So, so uh, I, I'll write it as d dimensions. I think you can do it two dimensions, three dimensions, whatever, one dimension. Right? So in general, this is a d-dimensional integral. And uh, uh, what I'll use here is, uh, because we are saying that we know what is the structure, uh, what is the field of one atom, right? And the Fourier transform of just one atom is Q dot uh, R integral, you know, DDR. You know, that's F of Q. That's that's what we're going to define as the Fourier transform, just one. one atom, right? And you see right away that uh, if the Fourier transform of F of R is F of Q, then what is the Fourier transform of R minus, say, Rj or Rk? Do you know this is a shifting theorem, right? You can change the variables here to R minus Rj, and you will end up with e to the power i q dot Rj times f of q. That's what you're going to end up with. So if you know the Fourier transform of f of r, when you shift the real space by this in, in reciprocal space, you accumulate a phase. That's the Fourier transform. And so essentially what you'll get is here, uh, I think we're a little bit over time. Is, is, uh, let me just finish this because we are almost done with this and then a good point to end. So uh, what I'm trying to say then is wh when you take the whole Fourier transform here, uh, the, uh, the sum you're going to get is sum of j. You get this quantity and what's left inside all this, uh, you know. Uh, so the after the, the integral gives you the f of q and what's left is, let me just write that down, f of q times e to the power i q dot. So that it's an integral over r, so the r's just go away, uh, and then you get rj. Right? That's it. There's not, nothing else left. It's a sum over complex exponentials times the Fourier transform of 1. Right? Does it make sense? Okay. So this is a very nice result, and, and I think uh, 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 you may have seen it in different forms, uh, but this is a very important result that the field, the Fourier transform of the field is equal to the Fourier transform of the single, single atom, single source of the field, times a sum over all, you know, e to the power iq dot all the locations of the atoms. So that's your summing over a complex exponential. And uh, so I mentioned that what you're really measuring is not phi of q, but square of that. That's what you're physically measuring. That's the intensity. So what you get here is f of q whole squared, right, times this square. So what you get then is a sum over j's e to the power i q dot rj. And I, let me write it this way, and I hope you, you make the connection what I'm writing, q dot rk. So I'm taking a small complex. I break it into two, right? Instead of writing it together, I, I have use a dummy symbol with J's and a K's, right? Does that make sense? And then, uh, 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 so if you have n atoms, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to do this now. N n atoms, we are going to normalize it by dividing this whole thing by n, right? Just just for arguments, and we're going to just do that. And this quantity here. This whole quantity is what's called the structure factor. This is defined as the structure factor of this solid, or liquid, or gas, or whatever you have. And what we'll see next time is, uh, you know, this thing, in the most perfect case, 
this thing will look like n. If you have n atoms, the value of the structure factor for a perfect crystal is equal to n, the total number of atoms. So it could be 10 to the power 23, for example, if you have a perfect crystal. If you have an amorphous crystal, it's, it's, it's very low. You know, I mean, the value is very small, and then it, it, it basically you'll have destructive interference between all these things, and then you get, and then that's what will, and then the picture of the structure factor is basically what you have there. Extra diffraction. Okay, so so we'll we'll start from here in the next class after the break.